All right, thanks for your patience while I had to restart the computer. All right, so this next thing is the fundamental theorem of calculus. So it's kind of important. Um, and you'll see me abbreviate it FTC, just you know, for, for not having to write the whole thing out. So if a function is continuous on interval A to B, and then they do this thing with the capital letter F being the antiderivative, like we ran out of letters of the alphabet or something. But anyway, what this says is if you have integral from A to B, lowercase f of x dx, you do the antiderivative, so it's capital F, and you evaluate upper boundary minus lower boundary. And so that allows you to find the area under the curve from A to B. So far, the only ways that we had to find the area of the curve were to draw the graph and then find the area. And you can only do areas of like triangles, and semicircles, and rectangles. Do you know what I'm saying? This allows you to do it no matter what. So you find the antiderivative and its upper boundary minus lower boundary. So again, to compare and contrast, here you're going to get an actual numeric answer. This is an area. Remember what you're actually finding is an area. Okay, maybe draw some stars next to that. That's a definite integral. The indefinite integrals did not have boundaries on them and we just stuck a plus C at the end. But here you're gonna actually like get an answer. All right, so for this first one, antiderivative of X squared, what would that give us? Antiderivative, one third X cubed. And then what you do is you put this bar that means such that, it is a such that bar, you want to evaluate from zero to one. So people are always like, when do I stop writing the integral symbol? Once you do the antiderivative, that's where you drop that and you put the such that bar. It's kind of like when you do a square root, like your square root of 25 is five. Once you do the square root, you don't write the square root symbol anymore. Does that make sense? Like once you do the antiderivative, you no longer write the integral symbol. All right, so that's where that drops out. So now we're gonna do upper boundary minus lower boundary. If you plug in one to this, what do you get? If you plug in one right here, one third minus, and then if you plug in zero, zero and a third minus zero is a third. If you look back at your notes from last class, that was the very first problem that we did with all the Riemann sums. Do you remember that? And then do you remember how to type it in the calculator? Math nine, and you can put that in zero to one x squared dx, one third. I love it. Okay, anyway. We want an antiderivative for 4x. So, like, that's the answer I'm looking for the question. Good. 2x squared, such that 0 to 1. Now it's going to be upper boundary minus lower boundary. I'm okay with you kind of skipping the lower boundary because you realize it's just going to be 0, right? I showed it to you on this one, but if you don't want to write minus 0, I'm cool with that. All right. So basically just plug in 1 and you get 2. All right, let's try another one. Antiderivative for this, that would be 1 third x cubed plus what? Good, one half x squared minus one x, good. Such that negative three to three. So it's gonna be upper boundary minus lower boundary. So let's plug in the three, three cubed. Be 27, a third of that is nine, plus three squared is nine, half of that, I'm just gonna leave it as nine halves. You could put 4.5 and then minus three. And now we're gonna plug in negative three. Do you see why it's helpful to draw the empty parentheses, like upper boundary minus lower boundary, leave it empty, because then you can just go back and fill it in. All right, plugging in negative three. Cubed would be negative 27, a third of that is negative nine, plus negative three squared is nine, half of that is nine halves, and then minus negative three will be plus three. All right, here's where the question comes up. How far do you want us to go? If it's free response, stop there, please. Don't go any further. However, I do wanna at least simplify this one down. I think after this one, I'll let you leave them alone. 
But let's say this was a multiple choice question. You're not gonna see this as a choice. So it's still an, an important skill and I don't want you to lose your skills. Here's what I suggest. You can get through it however you want, but I would distribute the negative sign first. So all this first stuff is gonna stay the same. Distribute the negative because oftentimes you can get something to cancel because the nine halves are gonna cancel. Do you see that there? So always distribute the negative first because sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you don't, but sometimes you get lucky. And then you can add and subtract up the rest of that. So what is that gonna give us? 12? And that's what you would see as your answer choice. So I'm gonna let you leave them alone but you can't lose your skills. You have to be able to do that. Your homework is multiple choice. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so let's try another one. Oh, what's that? So nine minus three would be six. Three's, oh, okay. This one, I'm gonna rewrite it first before we do the problem. So I'm gonna keep the integral symbol in there. How can you rewrite this so that you don't have the fraction in there? Well, that would still have a fraction. Like I want to get the x squared out of the denominator. Good, it would be to the negative two. So this will be two x to the negative two plus x. Let me clarify here. Oh, and then dx, I'm sorry, blasphemy and sacrilege. You need the dx there. Let me clarify real quick. When you have integral of one over x, that's ln, okay? If it is integral of one over x squared, or one over x to the third, or one over x to the fourth. If it's one over x to the anything else, it is not ln. That pattern is only for one over x. Have I made that clear enough? Because I get all the time people will try to write ln of x squared and that's not, it's only for this, right? These, you have to write them with a negative exponent and then do an antiderivative. So you would add one to this power. Be really careful. If you add one, it's gonna become less negative. What would that be? If you add one to this, negative one, good. Then you would wanna divide by a negative one, which would just make the thing negative. So negative two X to the negative one plus antiderivative of X is one half X squared. And then such that one to four. Let's fix this before we plug in the numbers. How can I rewrite that? Over x to the one, you can put the one in there, plus one half x squared, such that one to four. I just rewrote it. And then we're gonna do upper boundary minus lower boundary. So if you plug in four for x, negative two fourths, that would be negative a half, plus four squared is 16, half of that is eight. Then plug in one for X. That would give you negative two plus a half. I'm gonna let you stop there, but if I made you, could you keep going and distribute the negative sign and simplify further? Okay, because if it was multiple choice, you would have to. I realize that number 20 looks scary. Let's rewrite it. Do you see how it's that whole thing over four? You can take that and put it out front. Again, you can't evict a variable, but you can take out a coefficient. I'm gonna put that one fourth out front and then we'll have X plus square root of X. Now I don't wanna write square root. That would be X to the what power? One half, perfect. So now we're gonna do the antiderivative. So write it in a way that you know, is more convenient to you. That one fourth is just gonna hang out. That's the nice thing about picking that out. It's just gonna sit out front. Now we're gonna do the antiderivative. So what would it be for just plain X? Good. You see a lot of one half X squared and one third X cubed and one fourth X to the fourth. You see a lot of those, right? Plus, this is gonna be fun with fractions. You ready? You're gonna add one to this power. So a half plus one, good, would be three halves. And you wanna divide by that. So just put the reciprocal out front. 
I'm gonna say that again, you wanna divide by that. So just put the reciprocal out front. And that's kind of why I'm a person that likes to just write it out front as a coefficient. Again, if you're one of those people that likes to put the whole thing over it, that's fine, but it gets weird if you have a fraction. All right, such that one to four, we're gonna do upper boundary minus lower boundary. Oh, and I forgot about the one fourth. You stick a one fourth out front of the entire thing. All right, so if we plug in our upper boundary, plug in four, four squared is 16, half of that is eight. And I'm gonna be real honest with you. If this was me doing this on the AP exam and it was free response, I would be doing that. No joke. Yep. And then plug in one. One squared is one times a half would be a half plus. Now the nice thing about one, one to any power is one. And then times two thirds would be two thirds. I am a proponent of simplifying a little bit because if you, and if some people are like, well, can I just plug in the number and put parentheses? Yeah. I worry about copy errors though. Do you get what I'm saying? Like it becomes so complicated. If you simplify a little bit, you don't have to write as much. Now I am gonna talk about this though, just for the sake of getting you through it. This two means it would be a square root of four and then to the third power. That's what that means. It would be a square root of four to the third power. So just for the sake of being thorough, what would that come out to? It would be eight. Okay. And then, yeah, and then times two would be 16, so 16 thirds, good. Okay, let's try this one. This X to the third, that antiderivative would be one fourth X to the fourth, but there's already a two there. So it would be two fourths or one half. Minus E to the X, love that one, such that one to three. Every time you see E to the X, it's like you catch a break. It's like, yay. Upper boundary minus lower boundary. So if you plug in three, now you can leave it three to the fourth, but what if it's multiple choice? Do you know three to the fourth? You wanna think of it as three squared squared. Three squared is nine, squared again, 81. So this would be 81 halves minus e to the third. And then if you plug in one, you would have one half minus e. But remember, E is a number. So remember, you're getting a value. And don't forget what this represents because people work these out and then forget what on earth they're doing. What is it that we're finding? Area, the area under the curve, okay? Here comes some trig. You need a trig function that that's the derivative. So I'm gonna give you an example of negative. It's negative cosine. Negative cosine squared is negative cosecant cotangent. So this is negative cosecant such that pi over four to pi over two. Now, if it's free response, you can just do this, upper boundary minus lower boundary, and you can just plug them in. It would be negative cosecant of pi over two, and then minus negative cosecant pi over four. I want you to evaluate them though. If it's free response, you can do that, but if it's multiple choice, you can't. Where is pi over two on your unit circle? Is it up, down, left, or right? Uh, pi over two is up here the point zero one. Cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. Sine is the y value. So we're gonna reciprocate the y value. However, it's one, the reciprocal of one is one. So this would just be negative one. I don't know why I put parentheses around that. We don't need that at this point. Minus negatives, this is gonna cancel. We're gonna have plus. All right, pi over four is in the first quadrant. What are the sides of the triangle for pi over four? Good. They're both square root of two over two. Again, cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. Sine's the y value, you wanna flip that. If you reciprocate square root of two over two, you just get square root of two. You can go through simplifying that if you want, but it is crazy with the twos and I recommend just kind of knowing that one. So that would be your answer. We'll do one more and then we'll do another brain break, right? 
find the area bounded by these graphs. I would draw a picture. If you can do it in your head, that's totally cool. I need a picture, all right? E to the X, what does that look like? I call it a swoop. Swoop, X equals zero, vertical line. And then X equals two, another vertical line right here. And then Y equals zero, horizontal line. So this is the area that we're finding. So you have to set up the problem yourself. That's the only difference is you're having to set up the integral yourself. So what will the boundaries be? Yeah, zero to two. And then what's the function? Yeah, e to the x dx. You wanna be happy about this one because the antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x such that zero to two, it's upper boundary minus lower boundary. So it would be e squared minus e to the zero. What is e to the zero? So e squared minus one. And just for the sake of being thorough here, e squared minus one in the calculator, 6.389 units squared is this area right here. So that's what that comes out to be. Yeah, I always like to show that, like what it is in decimal form, because this doesn't really mean that much to us. But like, if you're like, oh, well, it's around six point something, that's a little bit more interesting. All right, so again, we're gonna have to set up the problem ourselves this time. And you just wanna draw it first. This is, you know, spoiler alert, we're gonna have two separate integrals here because there's two separate functions and we're gonna have to find where they meet up. So that first one, this is flashbacks to algebra one, however long ago that was for you. Remember y equals mx plus b? Okay, so you're gonna start at zero, three, and then your slope is up three over two. So up three over two. Or down three and left two. All right, and then the other one is going to be a parabola. Um, or I was about ready to tell you. I'll just ask you guys though. What's been done to it? Like, what are the transformations here? All right, up eight. So you can actually go up eight and put a point. All right, what else? X-axis, so it's gonna be upside down and then it's shrunk, vertical shrink by half. So let's plug in some numbers. Um, I would only plug in even numbers because dealing with the fraction there, let's plug in two. Two squared is four times negative a half would be negative two plus eight would be six. So you're gonna get two six, which that's where the two functions meet up. And then you're gonna have the same point on the other side, negative two six, because it's gonna be a parabola. And then let's go a little bit further. Let's plug in four. Four squared would be 16 times negative a half would be negative eight plus eight would be zero. So you're gonna get four zero, negative four zero. I'm not drawing this very well without a grid here, but you get the idea. So this is the area that we're looking for. This right here. And we're gonna split this, let me use another color. We're gonna split it right where the intersection happens. So it's gonna be split at two. And so like I said, it's gonna be two separate integrals. So what are gonna be the boundaries on the first integral? From where to where? Good, negative two to two. And which function are we underneath? Because again, it's the area under the curve. So which function are we underneath for that one? Yeah, right, the line, right? Three halves x plus three, dx. Plus, and then you're gonna set up another integral for the other one, like the rest of it. So what are the boundaries for that one? Good, two to four, 
And for that one, we're underneath the parabola. So negative one half x squared plus eight dx. So now there's two problems, all right? You would work both of them out. We're gonna kind of catch a break with the first one. You can do an antiderivative of this if you want, but we get an actual nice, like perfect shape there. What shape is this for the first one? The right triangle. So let's just do area of a triangle, one half base times height. Now, if you did an antiderivative, upper boundary minus lower boundary, you would get the same thing. But this way is just a little bit easier. So what's the base and what's the height? Four and six. All right, now this one, we're gonna do the antiderivative, upper boundary minus lower boundary. This is a curve. I was trying to draw it nicely so that didn't look straight there. I hope you can tell, it's a parabola. All right, so forget about this negative a half for a second. What would be your antiderivative for just the x squared? It'd be one third x cubed. One third times negative a half would be negative a sixth. So again, I usually just ignore the coefficient and then put it back. Plus antiderivative for eight would be eight X and then such that two to four. So let's simplify down this first part. This would be what, 12 plus, and then here we're gonna do upper boundary minus lower boundary. So if you plug in four, what do you guys know four cubed off the top of your head? Oh, good, 64 times negative a sixth. I would leave that as negative 64 to six. Plus eight times four is 32. And then if you plug in two, two cubed is eight. So that'd be negative eight, six plus 16. I'm not messing with that. If you had to though, you would distribute this negative, combine those six together and then simplify it that way. And then the last thing we're gonna look at is average value. Okay, if I gave you a list of numbers and I said here, average these, what would you do with them? Add them all together, divide by whatever you, are you do, you're doing that in stats too, right? Yes, add them all up, divide by what you've got. So the integral adds up all of the area. So that integral A, and I left a space in front of that intentionally. So leave a little bit of a space. The integral adds up all the area. Do you remember when we did that limit n goes to infinity and then that sigma? That sigma means sum, you're summing up everything. What did the n going to infinity mean? Remember what that meant? Rectangles, and your sub intervals goes to infinity, okay? But this is you adding up all the area and then just out front, you have to divide by the length of the interval. So divide by how much space you've got. Oh, I'm, is this coming back to you a little bit? Okay. People mix this up with average rate of change all the time. An average value involves an integral. So let's go ahead and bring this up. Average rate of change means what? Slope, regular old algebra one slope. They both have the word average in them, so I get why it happens. So just be careful is all I'm saying. All right, so let's find the average value of this function on the interval one to three. So out front, you would have one over three minus one, integral one to three of the function dx. Basically setting it up is the only new step. Now you're just gonna do the problem like we've been doing all the other ones. I get this all the time too. Ms. Cole, I know that three minus one is two. Can't I just write a half? Yeah, sure you can. But I think it's satisfying to see these match up. And also I get people that will subtract it wrong if they don't write that out. So just be careful is all I'm saying. But yes, that is a half. And then antiderivative would be one third X cubed plus two X squared. And then we're gonna evaluate from one to three. So that one half just sits out front of the whole thing. It's gonna be upper boundary minus lower boundary. I strongly recommend you set it up like this. Like set it up with blanks and then go and fill them in. Cause that'll help, all right? Three cubed is 27, third of that is nine. Plus three squared is nine plus two is 18. And then if you plug in one, you're gonna get a third plus two.
All right, let's try another one. Out front, you're gonna have one over pi over two minus zero, and then integral zero to pi over two cosine of x dx. It's very like formulaic how you set it up. So pi over two minus zero would just be pi over two. How would you write one over pi over two? That means you're gonna do what? It'll be two over pi, good, you're reciprocating. So this will be two over pi, antiderivative of cosine. You need a function that if you did the derivative, you would get cosine, like cosine's the answer. So good, sine, derivative of sine is cosine. We're gonna evaluate from zero to pi over two. I want you to evaluate these, okay? Two over pi is gonna sit out front. We're gonna do upper boundary minus lower boundary. Again, I think if you set, up, set it up with blanks in there and that will help. So sine of pi over two, using a word like up, down, left or right, where's pi over two? It's at the top, it's the point zero, one. Is it the zero or the one? It's the one, good, it's the y value. Now this is really zero pi, if you wanna put a pi in there, where is zero pi? Up, down, left or right on your unit circle? So the right, that's the point one, zero. So it would be zero. And so what's the answer to the whole thing? Cause we can simplify that down, right? It would just be two over pi, perfect. Yeah. All right, and then last one, we're gonna have one over four minus one, integral one to four, one over two X DX. I'm gonna write this out one more time before I do the antiderivative because that two always throws everybody off. What fraction have we got out front? Good, that's a one third. I'm gonna bring out that one half as well. So a third times a half would be a six. And then I can just write that as one over X because that lessens the confusion usually. So your antiderivative of one over X is ln, good. And so it'll be upper boundary minus lower boundary with a one sixth out front of the whole thing. So if you plug in four, you just get ln of four, you know, whatever that is. But if you plug in one, what's ln of one? Zero, good, and you do need to know that one. LN of one would be zero. All right, so now we're gonna use a graph, which I always like. I like when there's a picture because I'm a real visual person. All right, it says A, this part right here, this little bump is worth 2.3. So if you wanna fill that in, that's worth 2.3. They don't tell us what B is worth, but that's okay, we can figure it out. They tell us the integral from negative three to seven. So that's the entire thing from negative three to seven is negative 7.8. So that means if you have 2.3 plus B, you would get negative 7.8. And so you would subtract that over and B is gonna be negative uh, what is that, 10.1? Does it make sense that it's negative? Yeah, it's below C level. All right, and then we're gonna use that to answer all of these questions, all right? So integral from one to seven, that's from here to here. That's a review from last time. That would just be negative 10.1. Number 29, integral from one to negative three. So you're going from one to negative three. That means you're going backwards. So negative 2.3. Ooh, this one has an absolute value. That means you're gonna treat it all like it is positive. So from negative three to seven, that's the whole thing, but you're gonna treat them both like they're positive. So it would be 2.3 plus 10.1. So what is that, 12.4? Yeah, you would just treat them all like they're positive and then add them together. Yeah. Oh, because I see what you're saying. Otherwise, you would get a positive 7.8, which wouldn't be right. You want to like add it all up. All 
All right, and then average value from negative three to seven. So it would be one over seven minus negative three, integral from negative three to seven, f of x dx. People try to do this problem without setting it up like that. And you will, I'm saying you will mess it up. I'm not trying to insult you. Just write it out and it will be a lot less likely that you will have a mistake. Because there are two negatives there. What fraction do we have out front? One tenth. And then I don't know what happens here. People get to this part and lose their mind. You already did it, or it was given in the problem. From negative three to seven, 2.3 minus 10.1. Actually, that was given in the problem. From negative three to seven, it was negative 7.8. So like, just remember, you already have that information. That's not like something you have to work out. I get people that will try to do an antiderivative. There's no function given. Like it's just called f of x. You can't do that. And then this last one's the same kind of thing. Oh, except we have to find the areas ourselves. I threw this on here so we could practice finding areas of shapes, all right? I, I like this too, because it looks like a little city or so. Does it doesn't look like a skyline. I don't know, that's what it looks like to me. All right, so what's this first shape we've got? All right, trapezoid. One half times the height. Now remember it's on its side. So what's the height? One. And then add the bases together. That would be three plus one. So that's worth two, good. Now this next little part, you can break this up however you like. I think I would do it this way. Yeah, it looks like a little house. And actually I would do this whole rectangle together. This rectangle is five. Five by one, so five. And then this would be one half base times height, which would just be one. Or the other way you can look at it is like, do you see how this part is half of a block and then this is half of a block? So like one whole block, I don't know. So integral from one to seven would be that whole entire area. So like literally just add it all up, what do you get? Eight. And then your average value from one to seven. Again, please don't try to do it without writing it out. It's just not worth it. It only takes a second to write that. And then you won't have a mistake. Like you won't subtract wrong. Cause I get people that will write one seventh out front. It's not one seventh, it's one sixth. So just be careful. And then when you get here, you already did it. We just answered that it's eight. So eight sixths, that would reduce to four thirds. 